Good morning and welcome to, uh, I think week five. Yes, week five or week four, I'm sorry, week four, week four. <laughs> week four of uh, the late session start. So uh, I'm hoping that everybody is doing well. There are quite a few things that are gonna be happening uh, this week and next week. So I really want everybody to be on board. Uh, you will be receiving uh, basically uh, a message concerning uh, the midterm or the exam, I should say. The exam is going to be uh, not this Wednesday, not two days from today, but rather next Wednesday, October 5th. So that is gonna be our exam one. It's, going, it's not going to cover chapter two, but all the previous chapters. There is a light content coming from chapter one. The focus is actually on the chapters that are coming for waves, okay? Chapters 14, 15, 16, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, 15, 16, 17, 18, okay? So those are the four chapters that we're focusing on. They deal with sound. They deal with waves in general. They deal with light, especially the optics part of it. So. These are the chapters that are mainly heavily going to be tested. You are strongly urged to take the review as soon as it is available. I believe it's going to be available today if it's not already. Let me double check to make sure. Let me go first of all to the student view so that uh, to see it from your vantage point, and then I'm going to share it. Okay. So I'm going to share. Here is exam one review. Okay. There are quite a few number of uh, items that you would need to go through. So you really need to spend the time to do your review honestly and fully, okay? So the review, if I click on it right now and I'm logged in as a student is actually available, okay? So you could start it. It's made up of 337 questions. Uh, what I want to say is the following. Do not worry about the grade of the review. As long as you take the review, regardless of your actual score in the review, you're going to receive full credit for the review. The review is going to be part of your participation grade though, making sure that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing to prepare for the actual exam. So if you score, let's say for example, 50%, you're still going to get full credit for it uh, 100, uh, 100%. So just to encourage you to make sure you spend the time and don't worry about the grade part of it so that you're, 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 you're going to uh, prepare for the exam. It is a lot of material that you really need to go through. So you really need to dedicate the time you need to. You have plenty of time. You have this entire week. You also have the weekend and it's going to close on Wednesday, I'm sorry, on Tuesday evening around 11 p.m. or 11.59 or something after that. There will be no more reviews. So you really need to focus on the content so that you take the exam the next day. The exam, Exam one is going to be October 5th, uh, and you should have been ready for it. The exam only has one attempt at it. So you really need to be fully ready for it, take it, and then be done with it, okay? The exam is an hour and 40 minutes. So you really need to be focused and you need to actually uh, be not distracted by anything else outside, like for example, something else. If you have to work during daytime, don't worry about it. You still have the evening, the early evening to take the exam. If you have to work in the evening, you still have the day time to, uh, to do the exam. If all fails, you still have the time allotted for the uh, class to take the exam. So this time on Wednesday, October 5th, if all fails, this is the time when you're going to be taking the exam. I will be available for you guys if in case something happens. We will not have a live session on October the 5th because we will have that exam, so the focus will be on it. Exams usually have a lot of weight 
and they do actually in this case too, when it comes to your overall grade. That is why you have to take the entire preparation extremely serious and dedicate the time for it and be ready for it. I only wish and hope that everybody scores 100% in it. Okay, and the only way to do that, honestly, is to be fully ready for it. Okay, so this is something that is need to be done this week. And hopefully that you all guys on, on board on it. The other thing also, and let me show you also share the screen for it, that is different from the previous weeks. Share. Let me go back to the page I came from. You have a homework assignment and this time around, you are required to submit one problem. Doesn't matter which. I think you have like 10 or 11 problems. You are required to submit one of them for grading purposes. You're required to do all of them. You're required to understand all of them, how they're done. But you are only required to submit one of them. Pick and choose, it doesn't matter. And the rubric on how it's graded, it's actually in the assignment itself. So this is different. So I want you guys to be aware of it. It has a deadline on it, which is October 8th. That is the Saturday after the exam. So granted, you will be busy preparing for the exam. If you feel 100% confident you're done with the preparation, then you can start working on your homework assignment. If for some reason you feel like you need more time to focus on the exam, do so that takes precedence. That is more important, okay? Then work on your, on your, on your homework assignment after the, the midterm, after the exam. Okay, so this is the plan with it. At any point, regardless whether it's the preparation, whether the actual exam, or whether the homework assignments, you have difficulty with any of them, any of them please reach out, okay? And let's have a discussion on how to move on so that you're not stuck where, you're, where, uh, where you think is probably hard, so that we can overcome that difficulty and move on. If you have problem with the, uh, with the understanding of problems, please let me know. We will spend more time this coming Wednesday on the actual homework assignments, basically trying to understand how to proceed with them. I don't think that we can do all of them, but we will do enough so that you will have a full understanding of, of these things. So that you understand where we're coming from. Homework is a central component of learning, okay? You can do all the lectures in the world. You can read all the books in the world. You can even take quizzes, for example, that show understanding or learning of concepts. But unless you be able to do homework and actually uh, pull your sleeves and actually do stuff, uh, building concepts that way, you will not actually progress enough. So that is why they're essential building block in terms of the learning process. And that's why they are important. And not only that, Exam two will, be, will have two components in it. Exam two will have a type of exam one, namely basically this type of questions where your answer uh, are related to concepts, but also you will have questions related to problems, especially from the homework assignments, so that you can work out the problems and find solutions. For exam two, you will have two components. Exam one, no, it's only what is in the review is basically what you're supposed to be tested on. All the four chapters mainly that I mentioned before in addition to a little bit of understanding from chapter one, okay? Does this sound like it's a good plan? I know most of you guys are watching this thing recorded, but at least for the few who are here, and those actually who are watching it recorded also, and if you reach this point, and if things are not clear, please reach out, okay? Send me a message so that we can work out whatever difficulties we have so that you overcome them, okay? Can we move on to chapter two now? I actually had a question. Uh -huh. Are we going to be able to work on the homework in class at any time? On Wednesdays, usually I go through the problems. This coming Wednesday, toward the end. So if you're attending the class live, you should be able to see the uh, discussion of the homework assignment, especially for this Wednesday. As I was saying, I'm going to spend more time than usual on the homework assignments. Got it. 
Okay, so that's the plan. Usually the second period, the first period will focus mainly on the concepts and the second one of the week, uh, even when we do, when I'm teaching on campus, that's what I do actually. Uh, usually we have two, a lot of times in the week, the first one focus on the concepts and basically whatever stuff that we need to do. Granted that we may be, uh, do examples, but uh, in the uh, second session, we focus more on the assignments that are coming from the homework problems. Again, the homework is not really meant to be another exam. It's meant just to reinforce and help you guys learn the stuff. So it's not really that you have to be working by yourself without resources. No, as a matter of fact, you're encouraged to work in teams. You're encouraged to work with, with peers. You're work, uh, encouraged to work with classmates and reach out again. And if there is something that has a question that may benefit everybody, I may ask you with your permission, whoever is asking for a private session, to record that session for the rest of the class if we think that it may benefit everybody else. Then after all of that, you still have other resources on campus, like for example, the STEM Center, that is actually a very essential and very beneficial thing on campus. And uh, we actually visited it so you guys can go and ask for resources there and there are very very good actually uh, uh, physics tutors and then that can be of uh, great help okay so this is something that is not another exam it's not supposed to learn to, to basically test your learning up to that point it's supposed to reinforce what you've learned up to that point okay that's how i view it and that's how I hope that you guys will take it also so that you don't stress over it. Okay, so this week's content is related. So let me share another screen in here to chapter two. By the way, chapter two is not part of exam one. Chapter two is part of exam two, okay? And we may, may be, because again, chapter two and the stuff that is coming from it has more has two components, as I was saying, and an exam of this sort. Let me change the pencil. Yeah, chapter two. Pen is not writing. Did I, uh, it's not connected altogether, it is. Okay. So great, and my pen is not working today for some reason or the other. Okay, never mind that then. I'm going to write with the mouse, okay? Sorry about that. And it's gonna be a kind of a, because the mouse is really not a handy, and so unlike the pen, okay? So I'm hoping to have the, uh, okay. maybe sometimes it's really, Okay, very good. This was backward. That's the thing. It's kind of a. So apparently it was right. So, anyway, so chapter two, as I was saying, is not part of exam one. And because, as I was saying, uh, exam two, which is not this one, okay, will have two components in addition to basically uh, the type of multiple choice questions that we have in uh, exam one and the questions that are related to content, you will have actually another session independent. So you'll have two exams, okay? So you will have exam one, exam two part one and exam two part two. Exam two part two will really be dedicated just to the problems in here. And that is similar to the stuff that you're gonna be having in homework. So we really need to make sure that you guys are understanding the homework. That's why I'm requiring that you guys go through the entire homework assignment and choose of your own choice, uh, one problem and submit it, okay? For grading purposes, just to make sure that you guys are doing the homework. And then the rubric of how that is graded is actually on, on, on Canvas too, on the actual assignment. You will see what I'm looking for in terms of stuff, namely organization, namely answering the question, namely the units, and namely also the logic or the rationale that you built the, 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 the answer to it. So these are the things you need to be asking yourself, do we have all of that? So when you're going through the rubric, make sure you check all of the points that I'm looking for so that you say, yes, I do have this. Yes, I do have that. Yes, I do have that. Therefore, I should, have get, I should get the full credit for it. And that is exactly how your, how your exam two part two is going to be tested, is going to be graded too. So this is in a sense how things are going to be working. Okay, 
So this is basically the uh, stuff that uh, we have up to this point. So let's talk about chapter two. Chapter two, and there was a question actually, and we talked about it before, especially when we were in the lab, into why do we have this thing in here? We jumped from chapter one all the way to chapter 15, 16, 17, 18. And again, the short answer to that is because of the lab requirements, okay? We needed to cover those materials in the lab, namely the waves, the sound and optics and all of that, because that's how some of our classes are lined up. And we only have, unfortunately, one uh, uh, lab assistant who's preparing all of these materials and putting them together. So instead of doing basically multiple stuff in the same lab, they prefer that if we go through this workload and, I, and that's fine, okay? So we should not have any problems. Down the road, I may reconnect back to the concept that we do with waves and tell you, hey, you know why waves behave this one? It's because of this one. So I know it's a little bit kind of a, a afterthought, but that's not a problem. It should not really be uh, harming us. Okay, again, chapter two deals with motion. That is what chapter two uh, deals with. This is basically in a, in, in a simple way of saying it. Actually, a more technical way of calling it is the word kinematics. What is kinematics? It's the study of motion. That's really what, the, what this whole subject is. Okay, so that's the subject that we're, uh, we're, we're dealing with. And kinematics is related to a fundamental question in physics. And the question is the following. How or can I, can I predict the position of an object If I know its current position. So that's a question, basically. It's, it's making predictions. But it has some background information. I mean, I need to know where the object is now. Then can I make a prediction of where it's going to be? That's really the fundamental question that is actually in physics, actually, it's all about finding where objects are. Basically, that's in a nutshell what it is. So it really relates to another concept and it's really in the, in the statement itself and that is the concept of position itself. So in, also, in other words, that's what the fundamental question deals with. This is really the essence of the problem. This is really the, the foundation of everything. So we need to know where stuff is, where things are at. If I know them today, I should be able to predict their position tomorrow and so on and so forth. So that's in a nutshell what the whole thing is, okay? To make things simpler, and this is a very, very important concept that you really have to, or a skill that you have to take from this science, okay? From physics in general. And the skill is the following. You're tasked to find a solution to a problem. You're, you're asked to solve an issue, a problem. It doesn't matter whether it's in science, social sciences, even in, 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 in at work, whatever you are, a family, any other issue that you're faced, okay? It doesn't matter. The minute you step out, off of your bed and there is a challenge or an issue that you would need to address, how can you tackle it? How can you basically, uh, 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 move your way through it so that at the end you will see the fruition to your work and at the end you solve the actual issue or you get to the end of it basically. So the, 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 the skill that you will take from this concept and it's actually physics the one that started it is try to simplify the problem. Try to make it as easy as possible for yourself initially. Ignore the, the, the uh, the things that are distractions, if you just focus on the main concept and then start to add complexity to it until at the end you solve the actual problem you're facing with. So let me elaborate, let me give an example in here. Here, we want to find the position of an object. 
And the first thing in here is what is an object that we're talking about? It could be a car, it could be a planet, it could be a, a, a person running, it could be anything that you can think of. So instead of having to have all of these descriptions that can have masses, that can have a, a physical size, that can be too big to man maneuver, that can be all of that. So instead of that, physicists like to start with something as simple as possible. Something that does not have dimensions at all, namely a point. So this is the subject that we're talking about. This is the object that we want to find. It's a point. And what is a point? Is an object, in this case, that does not have dimensions at all, because it's the intersection of two lines, if you want to define it mathematically. So that is a point. It can have mass, if you like, because at some point, we need to append to it mass to describe its behavior. But at this point, it's a mathematical point called the point particle. So here is something. You started by asking something about an object, and it could be anything that you can encounter in life, a dog, a soccer ball, if you want to, or a classroom, or anything that you would plan it for that matter, a star, a whole galaxy, which is billions of stars. But then instead of talking about any of those objects, you're making it as simple as possible. And the simplest thing that you can think of is something that does not have dimensions at all. And that is a point. We're going to call it a point particle. So that is a simplification. So this is how basically uh, uh, the problem is going to be solved. But at the end of this course, you will be asking yourself questions about the whole universe. You'll be asking about atoms. You'll be asking about electricity. You'll be asking stuff that is actually big stuff, planets, for example. So yes, we start with something simple. But at the end, we're going to build our, 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 our knowledge to the end to get stuff that are far more complicated of a daily experience. Because at the end, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to describe daily experience, OK? So this is step one. Step two, also the position. The position could be anywhere if you want to. I mean, if somebody is outside driving they, or walking, they could wander anywhere, OK? They could actually dive into a, into a pool, for example, and go below the surface, or they could jump, for example, if they have, they could fly, for example, on a plane or something and get high. So they could go left or right, uh, uh, forward or backward, or up and down. Okay, That's at least the simplest way that you can think of. But instead of doing that, we're going to restrict the motion to a line. So we're going to restrict the motion on a line only strictly speaking. That way, we don't have to worry about, did the person jump up, jump up and down, or go left or right, or uh, south and north? We don't care about that. The person is restricted, or the, the as a matter of fact, the point particle that is of interest to us is restricted only to that line, OK? So this is called a one-dimensional motion so it's a motion on one line really okay so we're not going to be worried about the uh, the the particle that we're trying to describe to leave that line to go for example wander around it no it's not it's going to be restricted to that so this is as simple as we can do i mean we wish we could do it simpler than that and that having no particle at all but then that's a new thing we don't have a problem then at all because if we don't have a particle or restricted that there is no line basically it's sitting still where it is forever and ever and ever so at that point also it's a, it's a mute problem because then we know its position now we will know it forever and ever because it's not going to go anywhere but at least the simplest thing that you can think of is a point that has no dimensions, okay? It cannot be any bigger than that, but also sitting on one line. Leslie, since you came in late, I would strongly urge you to watch the uh, first 25 minutes because they're of extreme importance. We were discussing the review and all of the other things, okay? For the exam and exam one and all of this stuff. So it's very important that later on when the recording becomes available that you watch this uh, previous part, okay? So, at this point, as I was saying, uh, we have reduced the problem as simple as it can get. It's not going to get any simpler than that because then we will lose sight of the problem. The problem that we, the fundamental question that I said we really need to answer is then cannot be posed, cannot be asked then at, the, at that point. So 
This is as simple as that. Then at the end, at some point, we will be studying stuff that is a little bit more complicated. We will be asking questions that are uh, uh, that are of importance, for example, for two-dimensional problem, three-dimensional problem, and so on and so forth. Okay. Then we will make it more complicated, if you wish. So this is the skill, and it's a very, very important skill, whether at work, whether at home, whether in your family, whether in your uh, in your uh, work-related uh, tasks, or you're driving, whatever you are doing. This is as simple as it can get. Okay. This is basically the skill that you need to do is try to simplify the problem first and then address that simplified version of the problem and try to expand and build on it, okay? So this is basically what we have so far. So this is the object that we have to focus on. We have a point. So the question was asking about point, object to position all of that. So we have a line and we're gonna convert it to something that you learned in math called the, 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 the number line. Okay, this is similar to that, okay? So basically what you have in here, you have an origin. So it's an important to have a reference. So this is the origin. This is where we're going to be measuring positions from, okay? In addition to that, we need an orientation, direction. It could be right, it could be left, but typically people use this direction, okay? So this is like some sort of a convention. In other words, here is the thing. Let's say, for example, we're restricting the motion on I-10, okay? I-10, then in this case, is going to be our number line. It's going to be the, the one-dimensional motion. And if you have a car that is traveling on I-10, then in this case, it can either go east or west. That's the only two options that you have in that, okay? Obviously, it can technically, a car can actually go around the curve, can exit and come around and go downtown or wherever he wants to. But in our case in here, we're restricting the motion only on I-10, okay? Anything outside of I-10 doesn't exist as far as we're concerned, okay? And we're going to take a position to say, for example, this is the starting position. It doesn't matter where this is the starting position, but we're gonna be referring this point, the, 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 the reference, the origin, okay? Anything on this side, for example, east, we're gonna call it positive. Anything on the west, we're gonna call it negative. That's That's, that's our calling, okay? Somebody asked me, say, no, you know what? I don't like that. I'm gonna call this direction positive and this direction negative, that's fine, okay? As long as you stick to your convention, that's all, okay? So now an object, of course, the number line has a unit. So this is, for example, one meter. This is two meters. This is three meters. This is four meters and so on and so forth, five meters. But then anything outside on the other side is gonna be a negative number. So this is gonna be a negative one meter. This is gonna be a negative two meters and so on, okay? Negative three meters. As long as these distances are the same, just because they are a meter each. So the distance between a two meter and a three meter is actually one meter step. The distance between a negative two meters, a negative three meters and a negative two meters is still a meter, okay? But in the other direction, that's all, okay? So this is basically what we're saying in here. So this is the position of the particle. So the position is a, is a, is a, uh, is the location, if you like, of an object with respect To a reference, okay, I'm gonna use the word reference, but it's really what I mean by it is an origin, okay? From that point on, everything is started counting. That's basically what it is. And usually it has a unit, okay? Increments of some units. I mean, if you don't like one meter, it's gonna be too tedious to do it for a car, then you use the kilometer or the mile, okay? How many miles are you, for example, from, let's say, for example, the origin is exactly where uh, I-215 meets uh, the 10, okay? Then that's fine, that's the origin, okay? Anything on this side, for example, red lens would be what? Five miles, seven miles, okay? On the east, so it's gonna be positive seven miles if the mile is your unit. I don't know, LA, for example, is gonna be what? Uh, 60, 55 miles, but it's gonna be negative 55 then in this case, LA, because it's in the west. So that's basically how things we're talking about in here. So this is roughly 
uh, what we're saying in English. So that's what I mean by position. So if a car, for example, is sitting on, on somewhere in downtown LA, then in this case, it has a position of negative 55. A car that is, for example, uh, 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 in Redlands on I-10, it's at positive seven. Okay, so that's basically what we're saying in here. So this is what we refer to as the position. So the position in the number line is a, is a, is a, is a uh, has positive or negative uh, values. In general, it's a vector though, because if we take back and call, call it, this is east-west number line. And for example, if we introduce immediately north-south, then in this case, a position is anything on the plane. So this becomes a little bit more complicated. So we, we elevated the problem from a simpler problem to a little bit more problem, but this is the position. The point being in here is it refers back to the origin in here. So this is the actual position and it's a vector. So the point I'm trying to argue in here that in general, because of the signs positive or negative, this position is actually a vector. And it's true, actually, it's easier to see in the case of a two dimensional position or three dimensional position. So it's actually a vector. So the position is a vector. So what I mean by a vector? The vector has a length. For example, for the case of the Redlands example, the length is seven miles, okay? For LA, it's 55 miles, not negative, it's 55 miles. That is the length, okay? The magnitude. And also it has direction. So those are the two essential components of a vector. It has a magnitude. For the case of position, the magnitude is the length. So I'm gonna put it in parentheses and say it's the length. And plus, so it's, the length will not do, give me a vector. So I need something else. I need direction plus direction. So that's what a vector is. That's what the position in this case is. So just telling you, hey, I am five miles away from, uh, from uh, the origin, five miles away from campus, for example, you have no clue where I am at. Okay? <laughs> because if I don't tell you in which direction, okay, what you could do in this case is take the center from the campus and take a, take a, take a, uh, and draw a circle of radius five miles. And it could be anywhere on those, uh, on that circle. Okay, so there is an ambiguity in here in position unless I specify where the direction is. So not only I have to tell you how far I am from campus, but I also tell you which direction I am. Otherwise, you will have no clue. Okay, here is how the complication arises. Let's go back to the example of the two dimensional example. You and your friends went camping. Okay, and you reached your campsite. Okay, and then you decide, you know what? I'm gonna go hiking, okay, on my own. Have my cell phone, no big deal. I can always call for help. And the GPS, I have it on my phone, so I can always return home. So you walk and immediately realize the GPS is actually not working, working okay? <laughs> so what you find in here is that according to your watch, you walk, for example, for five miles from camp, from camp. And then you had to rest and then walked another five miles. And then you get tired, you couldn't find your way back. Now you call your campsite because the phone still works except the GPS doesn't work in it. And you tell them, can you guys come and help me? Can you guys come and bring me back camp? I'm lost, okay? Here is the problem. Where would they find you? if they don't know your direction. It's a problem, big time. So you need to really know your direction. If you don't know your direction, this is how the search is. So here is campsite. And you said you walked for five miles. Here's a problem. You didn't tell them you walked straight line. You could have walked five miles like this, and you could be here. That's still five miles. So anywhere inside this sphere or this circle, I should say, you could be, because you could have gone in the other direction or this direction. And then after five miles again, you walked another five miles. So 
potentially you could have walked another five miles to this sphere now of radius, or this circle, I'm sorry, of radius 10 miles. But you could actually wander it back because you're hoping that since your watch is telling you how long you walk, you were hoping that you're gonna walk back to camp, but no, you could be anywhere inside this big circle. And that's why the direction is extremely important, okay? So now if they're gonna do a search rescue, I mean, rescue uh, search, what they're gonna do is they're going to look at the entire area of 10 miles to try to find you, okay? So that's why in here, the direction is essential. Without direction, this position will not be defined. So not telling them the fact that you are you have walked five miles and five miles without you telling them where you are with respect to their direction. Are you five miles to the east, five miles to the west, five miles to the north, five miles to the south, or five miles northeast? Okay. If you know that the degrees in here, that would be great. Then they can find you. So this is basically why the position is actually a vector. Okay. Great, we know the position, which is part of the essential part of the problem, okay? We need to define it on the number line with a special symbol, okay? And that's how the book follows it, so I'm going to follow the book. So again, this is the origin, so we're, we're sticking back to our number line, we're sticking back to our, our, our uh, one-dimensional uh, position. So we have an object, the origin in here, and if I label my units in here properly, again, these are positive numbers, these are positive number. And this is a given position, okay, X. Okay, it doesn't have to be a full integer of the units. It could be a fraction of a unit, by the way. It could be two and a half, for example. If it's two and a half, it's somewhere in here, okay? Not anywhere in here. So it's a really continuous number. So the position is labeled by usually, in our case, usually, the position is labeled, or let's say, for example, uses the symbol, okay, because symbolized, okay, okay, symbol uh, uses symbol because it's really a symbol, so I don't want to use the label. You have label is a description, okay, uses the symbol X, okay. So the letter X. Now, don't be too alarmed if you see a different symbol, okay? Sometimes we label it by, or we use the symbol Y or Z. Typically, uh, Y in this case, if I'm going to use for the X this direction, Y is the opposite direction, okay? So that's gonna be Y. And to, if you see a problem, for example, or somewhere in the literature or somewhere in another book or something, or even in this book, actually, and they use the symbol Y, it's for a reason. Okay, sometimes the height is not using the letter X. So don't be too alarmed. And we're going to do projectile motion at some point, and the projectile motion will use both X and Y for position. X is the horizontal position, and Y is the vertical position. Okay, so those are just symbols. We could have called it a dog, for example, for all we care. It's the same thing. It's a symbol, just a representation. Don't be, uh, how should I say? Don't give it more than that value, okay? So we, we use symbols interchangeably all the time, okay? Uh, we could have called it, for example, the Greek letter alpha or beta or something, okay? And we do that a lot in, in, uh, in, in physics, okay? Uh, so this is basically up to this point, we talked about the position. Here is the problem with what I'm describing up to this point. If I know the position now, there is no way for me to predict what the position is. I need another quantity to make my predictions work, okay? Because if I tell you, for example, hey, I am seven miles from campus. When can I get to campus, do you think? Is there a way for you to make a prediction? There is absolutely no way if I don't tell you how fast I'm moving. So we need the speed. If I'm basically riding my bike, I'm going to take a lot longer if I am, if I am uh, driving. 
compared to driving. I mean, driving a car will take me probably maybe 20 minutes. Uh, riding on a bike probably is going to take me what? An hour and maybe something, depending on how fast the bike is. And if I'm walking, it's even longer, okay? And if I'm working in the going in the wrong direction, even if I'm driving, I'm not gonna be there at all. Probably I'm going to be lost again. So again, we need a velocity. We need a speed, okay? So that is essential. So the speed is the rate at which the position changes with time. So now we need something else actually. So just having a meter stick in here will not be good enough. We need a way of keeping tap of time, how much time is going, moving around. So we need a clock actually too, that keeps tap of the time. So we need to measure time also. So this positions that I was referring earlier, one meter, two meter, three meters, all we need is just a ruler for that, okay? But that's not going to be enough now if we want to really answer the fundamental question that we asked earlier to begin with, if you guys remember, was to make a prediction where the object is going to be. Okay. And in order to answer that, we really need another measurement. We need time. Okay. So here is the deal. Let's say, for example, the object, this is the origin. It was here at one meter, okay? So this is my initial position. The initial position, usually write to on it the xi, sometimes you will write in the different liter literature x1. Okay, it's the same thing, okay? And keeping tap of only the initial and the final, we use, use the, the letter i and the f for final. But if I'm keeping tab of multiple positions, then in this case, I really should use x1, x2, x3, and so on and so forth. So it's an index. So the index i stands for initial index 1 to distinguish it. from further indices, okay? That's basically what the whole thing is. So in this case, because in, when I write one and two and three, I'm assuming that there will be, I mean, when I write one, I'm assuming that there will be a two and a three and a four. When I write x, i, I really mean that there will probably only one uh, x, f, okay? So, Let's say, for example, uh, this is how, when this happened, that's a critical piece of uh, information. This is happened initially. So this is happened when T was zero. At that point, I'm going to click on my timer when the object was at XI, when the object was in one meter. So at that time, I click on the timer and say, okay, start now. You guys understand? So I'm doing this experiment. This is the time when I'm going to start the timer. I'm going to end the timer here. Let's say, for example, after two seconds, the object ended up at XF, which is the final position. And let's say for the sake of argument, this is a position five meters, okay? So this could be my X2 because I'm planning to do probably another X or something. So I could call it X2. So this is what happened. So this is the start of the timer, start of time. And this is the end of time, not the end of time, end of time. I mean, the, the timer when it's turned off, okay? End of time or the final time, if you like, okay? We don't care. I mean, there is probably the time that lapsed after that. We don't care about that, okay? We just care about that time for our experiment. Okay, so we know the position was one meter and the position now is five meters after a time lapse of two seconds. Because how long time lapsed? The time lapse, it's the final time. So I'm gonna call this one TF also, and I'm call it, calling this one TI. So the time is final time, which is two seconds. And the initial time, which is where we started the clock anyway, zero seconds. And we're gonna subtract it two. 
So the final time minus the initial time, that is actually two minus zero, and that is two seconds. So this is a time lapse. This is how, how long the clocks took. Now, you could, theoretically, you could choose to start the time before. That's fine. Then when did this event happen? If it happened, for example, it's 10 times, 10 seconds after you started the clock, then this will be 10 and this will be 12. It's still the time that lapsed in this case, still two seconds. So regardless of the origin of time, when you start the timer, the time that lapsed should not change. It's the same time that lapsed between the first event and the second event. You could have started a long, long time ago. Okay, this is World War One, if you want to. But this time in here will be since World War One plus this whole time that lapsed up to this point. And now this will be your, basically where the event one took, basically where the object was at position one meter. Then the next measurement is actually that same event that happened before plus two seconds, because the time that lapsed is still two seconds. Usually, and this is something that hopefully doesn't scare people in here. We use the letter delta to measure any variation, okay? Delta T in this case is going to be the final time minus the initial time. So the Greek letter delta, this is capital delta. There are another Greek letter that you might see if you look for delta. This is the lowercase delta. And this is the uppercase delta. It's also delta. Okay, so again, Greek letters, they come in handy sometimes. So when you write Delta T, you are really, all you're saying in here is by definition, it's the final time minus the initial time. For my case, for my experiments, it's two seconds, okay? Then in a similar fashion, I'm going to define another Delta. So this is the change, if you wish, this is the change in time. We call it, the lapse in time, okay? That's basically what we use. So delta x now is going to be, by definition also, similar to the first one, the final position minus the initial position. So this is the change in position. In other words, where was the object before and now what it is? So it's in this case, it's gonna be xf minus xi. It's clearly five minus one is four meters. So in my example, this is four meters because XF is five meters and this one is actually one meter. So in my case, this Delta X is nothing but four meters. And the lapse of time again, in my case in here, it's two seconds because two minus zero is two seconds. Okay. So this is basically the change in time uh, the change in time, which is two seconds, and the change in position, which is four meters, okay? By definition, we're gonna call the velocity or the speed in this case, the speed. Usually we use the letter V, okay, for the speed. And in this case is going to be by definition an average value, okay? Average value as the change in position over the change in time. Okay. In my case, in my example, this is four meters over two seconds. Obviously, four over two is just two. So this is two meters for every second. Okay. So this is what I meant by the speed, the average speed in this case. Okay. Symbolically, we could have written it if I call this one the position, uh, the change in position. So this is x, and the time it takes is t. I could have written it as x over t also. Okay? So this is the average value. We put the bar on top just to indicate it's an average. So really, we should have put a bar in here. So the bar indicates that this is an average, okay? So let's define the speed again in plain uh, language. The average speed is the ratio 
of change in position over change in time. It's measured, it is measured in meter per second. So that's the unit for it, okay? In SI, it's meter per second. I mean, it's it's nonsense to say my car is going, let's say for example, the police officer stops you and says, hey, you're doing 65 miles per hour in a zone that is supposed to be 60 miles per hour. So no, 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 you're wrong. Okay, I was not doing 65 miles per hour. I was doing 27 meters per second. I mean, I argue with you and I think the number 27, 65 doesn't make sense because according to my odometer, let's say for example, you're using your phone as your odometer and it's reporting an SI in the System International uh, for, uh, for your position. Then in this case, oh, I'm doing it actually, here is my phone. You're giving me 65, now I'm doing 27. So your units sometimes can be a little bit of tricky. I'm, obviously, he's going, if, he's, if he knows the units, he's going to convert it and tell you, you know what? You're right. Still, uh, you're in violation because it's supposed to be 26 miles, 26 meters per second because the conversion stuff. I don't know. I didn't do the math, okay? It's an interesting question, really. So let me see if I can put a calculator. Calculator because you might be doing this. Okay, so let me get a calculator. And once I get the calculator, I'm going to share the calculator with you. Okay, because I just pulled the number in here and just said it. Okay, so let's say, for example, we're in, in, in this situation. Okay, again, we said 65 miles per hour and a mile is 1.6 kilometers. So I'm going to use 1.6 times 65 miles per hour and convert everything to meters, okay? So I'm gonna do a little bit of, uh, 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 and if you have difficulty with it, please let me know because this is not part of the requirement. I'm just kind of curious myself. 65 miles per hour times 1.6. This is how many kilometers per, uh, per hour? So it's 104 kilometers per hour. Kilometer is a thousand meters. So I'm gonna multiply this one by a thousand. So you're doing 104,000 meters per, se per hour, but an hour actually 3,600 seconds. Remember an hour has 60 minutes and a minute has 60 seconds, 60 times 60 is 3,600. So that's 3,600. We're dividing the number by 3,600. So actually you're saying 28.888 or 29 meters per second. So I, the, the fact I said 27 was not correct. So you could have told them, hey, no, you're saying 65 miles per hour. I actually do, was doing 29. And you can show him your phone. Hey, my phone shows I'm doing 29. Obviously, you forgot to mention the fact that it's in meter per second, which is the same thing. I just did the conversion. 29 meters per second is equivalent to 65 miles per hour. Obviously, the officer would say, you know what? The speed limit, since you're using meter per second, is 60 miles per hour, and a mile is one point. What is the decimal point in here? Point six, okay. So this is 96 basically uh, kilometers per hour times a thousand if you like. Now it's 96,000 meters per hour, but again, an hour is 3,600 per second. So actually the speed limit is only 26.67 or 26 point, let's rough it up and say 27 meters per second. So yes, you are in violation, even though you are using your phone to show you, to show me that you're doing 29 meters per second. And, uh, <clears throat> and I'm telling you, you're doing 65 miles per hour, which is the same number, okay? So this is how conversions work, okay? And it's an important point to remember in here from this discussion is, that the speed, but the units in general matter into which units are using. So let me go back into my notes in here. So when I say the units are in meter per second, what I really meant with it is, this is the units that is agreed on and it is what is known as the SI, okay? In, uh, and for example, daily uh, measurements, we use the miles per hour, 
and a mile has 1.6 kilometers and one kilometer is a thousand meters. Okay, that's basically how you do the conversion. That's what I just did. And the hour, <clears throat> one hour, which is 60 minutes and 60 minutes is six, uh, each minute is 60 seconds. So an hour is six, 3,600 seconds. Okay, it's the same thing. So you could use kilometers per hour or miles per hour, but in SI is going to be a meter per second. You could actually use feet per second if you like. Okay, or feet per, yeah, feet per second in this case. Okay, so that's a more uh, useful also unit. But again, they're all not the standard SI, which is really what is used in science. So that is the speed. And it's an average speed. Again, it's a vector. The velocity is a vector. Its magnitude is the speed itself. And the direction plus direction to make it into a vector. Because let's say, for example, I'm, I'm on I-10 and I'm looking at my speedometer. And uh, I tell you, for example, hey, I am going according to my speedometer at 50 miles per hour. When do you think I can arrive? When do you think I can come to campus? When do you think I can get there near the uh, I-215? You could not answer the question. First of all, you need to know where I am. So this is the origin. And if I tell you I am going at 50 miles per hour, that will not help you determine when I'm going to come back. Even if I tell you what I am, even if I tell you I am at, let's say, for example, 50 miles away from the, where you are, obviously it's going to take an hour if I am moving in the right direction. That's the question. Let's say, for example, I am on the east. Okay, I'm at a position of 50 miles and I'm going 50 miles per hour. You will not be able to help me to tell me when I'm going to arrive because I still could be going this way. So I'm getting away from you. Then in this case, I will never be there. Or if I am moving in this direction, then it will take me one hour to get there. You guys understand the point in here? So just the fact that you know the speed will not be able to help you. You need the direction of the speed. And you also need the position to be able to determine where the object is going to be. So you need the initial position which is in this case 50 miles, and you need the speed with which you're moving to be able to determine the, the, the final position. So this is really the whole essence of the problem. Now we are in business, okay? So the velocity, we use the velocity in here to refer to the fact that it's a vector, okay? That's why we use the symbol V and we don't use this symbol S for the speed, okay? Because it's more general than just that. Now, this is an average quantity. There is another quantity of interest to us in here, which is the instantaneous velocity. The instantaneous velocity, meaning the velocity at that moment. When you look at your odometer, it's giving you the velocity at that instant. It's not giving you an average, for example, and it's important to understand the average versus the instantaneous velocity. Let's say, for example, I am going from home to work. And let's say, for example, it takes me an hour to drive there, one hour. And the distance for, let's say, for example, it's 30, 30 miles. So on average, my speed is 30 miles per hour. So this is the average speed day in, day out, or even on that given day, I took, 30, I took one hour to drive 30 miles, okay? So my average speed in this case is 30 miles. However, at some point, I was doing actually 50 miles per hour speeding up. So that is the instantaneous speed. At some point, I was sitting in the red light, okay? Not driving at all with the velocity equal to zero. So 
the instantaneous velocity in this case could be higher or lower than the actual average velocity. So the average velocity in this case is over a big span of time, whereas the instantaneous velocity is worth that moment. That is the difference we refer to. So it's at that instant, at that instant. That's the big difference between the two. So the first one is averaged over a big span of time. Obviously, before going to work, it takes you time to accelerate. So from going from completely stop to accelerating, that is a time when you're gaining speed. And then when you get to your work, you need to slow down and stop. So again, you're, you're losing that speed. So it's not maintain 30 miles uh, per hour from get go to all the way to the end. There is no way you could do that. You need to speed up and then you need to lose speed when you get there. Besides, practically, you're gonna be stopped in red lights. You're gonna be stopped somewhere else. And at some point the speed will pick up in certain designated areas where it becomes 45 miles per hour. And you could speed up to that 45 miles per hour. So that is but at some points it's 35 miles per hour. So you could slow down to 35 miles per hour. At some point, probably you could enter the freeway and get up on 65 miles per hour. So the point being in here is the instantaneous speed is those speeds at that moment. So what is that? The definition for it? It's basically the same thing as before, except this delta t is as small as possible. As small as possible. That's the only difference. So how fast, how, what's your displacement? So in other words, the, the odometer takes two positions, one and after the other, to find your instantaneous speed, okay? You were here now, and then you move a fraction of a second, and then it's going to find where you are, divides by the two, and then it's going to tell you, hey, your, uh, your speed is this at that moment, okay? So again, the instantaneous velocity, which is usually referred to as simply velocity, is the rate at which position changes with time. Okay, so this is really the essence of that definition. Okay, so there is a distinction between the two. An average velocity is over a big span of time that could include places where you sped up, places where you stop down and so on and so forth. And it's the overall, okay? Between a finite time, and in this case, as small as possible. So this Delta T in the first one in here is finite, big in other words, for the average velocity. Whereas in the case of the instantaneous velocity is as small as possible, practically as close from zero. Okay, as close from zero as you can get. So this is as small as possible. That's the big difference between V bar and V. Okay, so this is two essential quantities that emerge in this case. So now, knowing your speed, you knowing your current position, you really can make a prediction, like the example I gave earlier in this case. Where is it? The, uh, the case of the 50 miles away from somewhere. If you are 100 miles and going 50 miles per hour and going in the right direction, 50 miles, each 50 miles you drive, uh, it takes you an hour and you are 100 miles. If you are at 100 miles, it's gonna take you two hours. That's as simple as that. As a matter of fact, in this case, if you are moving with constant speed, your position in this case is equal to your speed times your time plus the initial position, okay? So this is your position. This is your speed or velocity, I should say. It could be positive, it could be negative. This is the time at given time, any place. And this is your initial position, okay? If you find difficulty with this expression, don't be scared of it. It's just the same thing I was saying in here, except symbolically, that's all. That's the only difference in there. But don't be afraid of it. Just ignore it if it becomes too much of an issue, okay? But that's the point in here on how to find position. So in other words, I can make predictions of the future if I know these two things. That's really the essence of what we're saying in here. We can predict things. Up to this point, we're describing positions and, and, uh, and uh, velocity or speed, okay? Mr. Galileo, 
was concerned with this stuff. So it's actually Mr. Galileo who laid the foundation to a lot of these things in terms of coming up with numbers and later on measured the value of G, okay? Let me introduce the idea, first of all, of the acceleration. Okay. Similarly, as we define the velocity being the ratio of basically the position over time, in this case, we're going to define the change in velocity over uh, time. Basically, let's say, for example, your car goes from 0 to 60 in 10 seconds. This is probably my car. Okay, It's not that fast, but that's fine. Okay, I don't care. Just let it on cruise control and let it pick up its speed, okay? So in this case, I gain 60 miles per hour in 10 seconds. In one second, how many? How much did I gain? Uh, in this case, in one second, if it's a uniform acceleration, of course, if I am, basically when I push on the gas, I have to maintain the same ratio. I shouldn't push more or less. If you push enough on the gas, and to maintain that one, that is uniform acceleration, okay? If you're doing the acceleration uniformly, uniform acceleration, I mean, what, what's the difference between the two is basically the first one, which is uniform acceleration, is you put your foot on the pedal and maintain that, 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 that gas basically intake, that how much gas goes to your engine. Somebody else might accelerate and continue to push more and more gas, basically, until he or she floors it. That is not uniform acceleration. That is a non-uniform acceleration. Okay? The acceleration in this case is changing. So what I want to do is put a acceleration and maintain that one. Don't, don't, don't make it more and more as time goes by. Okay? Or if you wish, don't accelerate and then leave your foot off of the accelerator also. That is going to make the acceleration less and less over time. Okay? So what I'm interested in is this type of motion where the acceleration is uniform. So in that case, the acceleration, in my example, the acceleration is going to be 60 miles per hour in 10 seconds. Okay. If I do 60 divided by 10, that is six. So I gain six miles per hour for every second. That's what that means. So in two seconds, I get 12. In three seconds, I get 18. In four seconds, I get, uh, what is it, 24. In five seconds, I get 30. And until I get 10 seconds, I get 60 miles per hour. So that's basically in a nutshell what that is. Here is how it works. So right now, the car is stopped. So the speed is zero. After one second, it goes from zero to six miles per hour. This is one second. After another one second, from the first, it goes to 12 MPH. After another second, it drives now at 18 MPH. After a th how many seconds so far? One, two, three, four. After the fourth second, now it's going 24 miles per hour. After the fifth second, it's going to be 30 miles per hour. The sixth second, it's 36 miles per hour. The seventh second, so this is the seventh second, by the way, from when we started. Uh, now we're doing actually 42 miles per hour. After the A second, it's going to be 48 miles per hour because each time you add another six miles per hour because it says for every second, you add another six miles per hour. So it's 48 after, so this is after eight seconds. After nine seconds, nine seconds has lapsed from the beginning. You add six to 48, that's going to be 54 miles per hour. And after 10 seconds, and you're maintaining that, that acceleration, okay, provided from the get-go, now you have reached 60, six seconds plus 54, that is actually 60 seconds, 60 miles, I'm sorry, per hour. You see what that means? 60 miles per hour in 10 seconds, that means you can gain six miles per hour for every second per second per second per second. That's basically until the whole thing, as long as it's uniform. That's a key thing in here. Because if you're accelerating more and more, obviously you will gain more in the next steps than what you gained in the previous steps because you're accelerating more and more. And if you're not accelerating more and more, if you're accelerating less and less, you will gain less and less speed as time goes by. 
So how speed changes is governed by the acceleration. That's why the acceleration is important. Remember, we need two things actually to predict the, the position of an object in the future. We need to know its current position and we need to know its velocity. But the velocity could change and what governs it is this acceleration, okay? So the acceleration by definition, a bar, again, the average acceleration, acceleration is the change in velocity. Remember, this is the change, okay? Change. When you see the delta, it's always change over the change in time. Okay, so the average acceleration is the ratio, ratio, not ratio, of the average, the change in velocity. over the change in time. It's the same thing. That's really what it is. It's measured actually in SI in meter per second for every second. So this is in SI, the scientific basic notation. I was using miles per hour per second, but that's because the example has miles per hour for the speed, okay? And here, usually in SI, the speed is actually in meter per second, and the whole thing is per second. That's how we say it, My, uh, meters per second per second, meters per second per second. Or symbolically, we write it as meter per second squared. It's the same thing, okay? So if you see m over s to the power two, that is the same thing as saying meters per second per second. Obviously, the unit I used in here is in kilo, uh, is miles per hour per second, or kilometers per hour, uh, kilometers per hour also per second. That's another unit that you could be uh, you could be using too, especially if you are in the European side of the speeds. This whole example would be in in uh, in kilometers per hour per per second. Okay. So that is really the idea behind the, the, the acceleration. In a similar fashion, the instantaneous, instantaneous, instantaneous acceleration, acceleration would be simply A with not, so the symbol for it is A by the way, okay? A would be just, the change in velocity over the change in time when this change is as small as possible. So this is a finite change, this one in here. This is finite for the average, but this one as at when the change is as small as possible, okay? Key note in here, The acceleration is a vector, okay, four possibilities. And I know in one of the videos I included in the lectures in here, I delve into more details. Four possibilities. Either the velocity is in one direction and the acceleration is in the same direction, or the velocity is in the opposite direction and so is the acceleration. Both of them are in the same direction. In either of this case, the object is speeding up. So it's actually accelerating. Rating. In other words, it's gaining more and more speed. Okay. Another possibility, the velocity could be this way and you're hitting the brakes. The acceleration is the opposite direction. Or you could be moving in this direction and you're hitting the brakes in the opposite direction. So it's still A in one direction and B in this direction. So they are opposite to one another. In this case, this is a scenario of a deceleration or object is losing speed. So you're speeding down. Okay. 
and this is speeding up. It's an example, for example, take, take an object and throw it up, okay? Throw it in the sky, uh, sky. It's going to go, but it's going to slow down. It's not going to continue up, okay? So this is an example of a deceleration, at least of the first stage going up, okay? An object, if you let go of it, it's going to gain speed on its own and fall down. As a matter of fact, this is what Mr. Galileo has studied, and we're going to conclude with this one for today. Galileo. Studied this object extensively, okay, in the early 1600s, okay, and uh, he determined the value of the uh, acceleration on Earth. To be a, which is the acceleration, we usually use the letter g because we know it's due to gravity. So g in here refers to gravity. It doesn't refer to his name, which has a letter G. Actually, both of his first and last name has a G in it, okay? Galileo Galilei. So both of his names are uh, has a G in them. Mr. Galileo actually is known as Big Man G, okay? So because he did a lot of things with stuff like that one with gravity, okay? There is another symbol that we're gonna see down the road, which is Big G. And Big G actually is not related to his name either. It was introduced by, <clears throat> And Newton himself, <coughs> excuse me, and Newton borrowed the, a lot of the work of uh, Galileo also. So in this case, the value of G, which is 9.8 meter per second squared. He measured this one without having access actually to a, to a cell phone okay, or a watch or anything like that. He uses his, uh, his uh, pulses on his arm wrist, okay? And his, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, the wrist, yeah. So that's how he found it. We use in this class the absolute, uh, the approximate value of G, which is 10, roughly, if you wish, 10 meter per second squared. Again, it's 10 meter per second per second. In other words, if I do this experiment, throw an object upward, it's going to lose speed each time, each second of 10 meter per second per second. Because if I throw it up, this is how the object is moving up, but the gravity is always pulling down. So this is an example of either one of these two. So it's actually deceleration <clears throat> because the velocity with which I throw up the object and the acceleration G is pointing down. So in this case, the object is going to go up, stop, and then come back. When it's coming back, its velocity is pointing downward and the gravity is pointing down. So it's going to accelerate. It's going to come uh, faster and faster until it reaches the ground, okay? So this is in the... Uh, an example which we're going to build on actually next time when we come back, we're going to talk more extensively on the free fall. Okay. And the implications of that. So the, the free fall, so that you guys understand, it's motion upward or downward. And it has in it both the acceleration, it has the velocity, and it has a position also, all of these things. As I was saying in the beginning, usually in the scenarios, we don't usually use a letter, a letter X to represent the position, but rather we use a letter Y in this case, or even H for height or whatever symbol we're going to be using. Okay, please don't be basically be stuck with the symbols because they don't really have an inherent uh, property in them or an inherent concept in them. It's just symbols, they represent stuff, okay? Okay, uh, I think we have covered the stuff that needs to be covered today. Remember, on Wednesday when we meet, the plan is to finish the topics from this chapter and also to give a little bit, do a little bit more examples and then delve into the the uh, the homework assignment. I think you have quite few problems, uh, and you're required again to submit one of those problems as a homework assignment. I'm hoping that you guys do it while you're doing the review because. Uh, you should be able to be on, on track to do the review for the exam. Sounds good, guys? Yes? Very good. Very good. Thank you, guys. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, as I was saying, it's a good idea to watch because there was more discussion on that in the beginning, the first 25 minutes, but to answer your question is gonna be on the 5th of October, which is Wednesday, not this Wednesday, the Wednesday after. Sounds good, Leslie? Okay, very good. So I'm gonna stop the recording and I will see you guys in, uh, on, on Wednesday. Same time.